In this episode of the EGP Learning Pod Blast interview, I speak with Dr. Aisha Malik, a GP in Manchester, who is also the owner of doctorsinbusiness.org. This website is designed to try and support GPs as they work within general practice, as well as trying to manage the business aspect, particularly from a social media perspective. She runs regular webinars that inform GPs as to the various services that she does, and hints and tips in terms of how to use a variety of social media aspects like YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. In addition, she's also in the Clinical Entrepreneur Program, which we talk about in terms of her plans of how this will develop and how she'll share the information with all of you, our listeners. We also talk about some fun things like her favourite apps and what she would do with £100 million and no red tape to spend on health technology. Highly recommend having a listen to this episode, guys. So let's get straight into it, shall we? So today I'm joined by Dr. Aisha Malik, who's um, actually a former colleague of mine. We went to university together and, and trained at um, Leeds University. And then we've actually recently got back in contact with a, a couple of the ventures that we've both been looking at, and particularly in terms of the work that Aisha's been doing lately. Are you there, Aisha? Yep, I'm here. How are we doing today? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So um, why don't we start by telling everybody about you, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, cool. So um, I'm a GP. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, qualif- fully qualified as a GP in 2013, uh, mm-hmm. and I was a partner in practice for four and a half years, um, just up until about mid last year. Uh, and alongside um, general practice, I've always worked in the arts. So I run an uh, I run an arts business as well, and it's through mm-hmm. my arts business I got um, I trained in um, social media uh, and digital marketing. And okay. I'm at this interesting point now um, in my career where I'm seeing kind of a crossover of all these skills that I've learned in the arts sector and in general practice. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's where I am. <laughs> okay. You mentioned starting off in general practice in 2013 and becoming a partner. Yeah. How was that whole experience? Because obviously partnership at the moment is one of those things that people are looking at a little bit differently you know, how, compared to how it was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it was, it was, it was definitely an upward leap, a vertical leap into, you know, um, leadership, you know, kind of straight away mm-hmm. in the driving seat of steering a struggling practice um, through a lot of changes. Um, okay. Obviously, you know, that the, the GP landscape is, it is what it is at the moment. It, it feel, you know, everything feels like new territory. So it was definitely a challenge. It was really interesting. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I'm I'm very proud of the work I did at the practice because it was struggling, and um, it's uh, as I left the practice, it had its final CQC um, review, and it was reviewed as good. So it was definitely um, it was such a valuable experience. Um, I think I was exposed to so many different elements of you know, what it is to be a GP, um, what it is to step into that, you know, traditional role, if you like, of initially single-handed and then moving through a partnership. Uh, And I think for me, for various reasons, um, it was time to move on, not only because of uh, area, you know, I was was, uh, living somewhere else Mm -hmm. and commuting, but because of the obvious pressures as well. And it just, it was, I think my role there ended up incongruent with where I wanted to be, which was pursuing sort of... um, innovation if you like within general practice so yeah that, that's okay. the that's the short version <laughs> fair enough uh, I mean you mentioned some of the changes that you made within the practice I mean, yeah. can you give us any examples of kind of the you know the, the kind of things that came your way yeah so so a lot of it was kind of nuts and bolts things so I think when when I started off in that in the practice it was the first wave of cqc inspections and the challenges for the practice was now looking back it's where a lot of practices were were seeing challenges which is around governance information governance things like that um you know i i looked a lot at how we could provide our services in more of a targeted way to targeted way to our population which largely wasn't english speaking there were a lot of mm-hmm. cultural barriers um which meant that people weren't accessing services as they could so there were a lot of changes which were mainly based around communication um actually and making sure that the services were fit for the population on that patch a lot of governance things were put in um 
just implementing systems that meant I mean, I think the old school way of running practices, you know, if you're single handed was that you sort of just kind of did everything yourself, didn't you? And there, there were a lot of yeah. things that were still sort of paper based. So, so, so just okay. it was simple tweaks here or there, really. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned about communication being um, a key part of this. So yeah. um, you have told us about, you know, your, your love of social media and how you've started using that. How, how, did you start marrying those two things up at that point? Or was that something that happened later on? Interestingly, no, not at that point. It was something that came uh, later on. Mm -hmm. So what I did realize in my time there at the patch was that there was um, a scarcity of culturally relevant education services, okay. in, particularly, in particular around diabetes. Um, I mean, the irony is not lost. It was a South Asian population and <laughs> the HBA yeah. ones, these are the average you know, person in their mid-30s who's a taxi driver, mm -hmm you know, and runs a takeaway, you know, you can imagine sort of what the profile was. But when you were sending people off to, to their education days, the referrals yeah. were rejected because th there were no interpreters uh, mm -hmm. or, or there wasn't anyone delivering them in, in kind of uh, in the right language or with culturally relevant references. Um, mm -hmm. And so actually what I then did was that year I bid for non-recurrent funds um, okay. together with uh, okay. the other partner at the practice to deliver something that was culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in the digital mm -hmm. format, but that was what then got me to thinking about the skills I was using in social media. Mm -hmm. um, and I had uh, created an online course in the arts sector, nothing medicine related. It was actually um, dance related. Cool. And I looked at that and I thought, actually, if there was something, if there was like a, a very simple digital course that was language specific, used culturally relevant references, if you like, mm -hmm. then actually I could mm -hmm. really see that working because the South Asian population on that patch were actually very, very active on social media they all had smartphones they're all doing their thing and I thought wow wouldn't it be easier if I could just refer them to this digital place if you like and say oh look at this watch these four lessons and then that's your education done and that then became the inspiration to me pitching this year for the clinical entrepreneur program okay so I pitched a version okay. of that idea um and and I've, I've been successful in getting onto the program so that starts in September so I'm really excited about that mm -hmm. so that that was mm -hmm. kind of where I started to think about so much of what we do in general practice uh, practice is communication and the, there was such a gap between what we were wanting the patients to do and what their blood results were saying that I just started to I guess think creatively like how can we get around those barriers okay you mentioned the clinical um entrepreneur pr um, program yeah. yeah can you tell us a bit more about yeah. that because i'm not sure if some of our listeners would have heard of that before yeah so the clinical entrepreneur program i think is running in its third year mm -hmm. i haven't i've just been accepted so i'm completely new to this so if there's anyone listening to this who's already on it they may be better qualified to talk about all the nuts and bolts okay. of it <laughs> so that's my slight disclaimer but my understanding is that um the 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 philosophy and the intention behind it um there's a guy uh, there's a um a professor on Twitter called uh, Prof Tony Young, mm -hmm. who's kind of heading the whole thing. And his real inspiration is that innovation, we have like some of the brightest minds in the entire UK mm -hmm. in um, within the NHS, and that innovation needs to start happening within the NHS and from the workforce, mm -hmm. because we are ideally placed to be looking at where those gaps are, you know, what are the things that frustrate us, what are the things that really need to change. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I don't know whether you agree with me, but you, you can I, I kind of see this all the time, my colleagues, you know, as, as GPs, we are polymaths, you know, we are multitaskers, mm -hmm. we are multi-talented, and that when I heard him speak about it, it completely resonated with me because how many times have you sat in general practice and thought, oh my God, if there was just this like mm -hmm. thing, then that would solve like this problem and it would make everything easier and save everyone time. And and so I, look, I looked at the program, the brief of the program for this year. Um, and I saw I had about a week to apply mm -hmm. for it. So I did. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and so what happens is if you're successful in getting onto the program, 
from my understanding, understanding is you don't necessarily have to have an idea. Mm-hmm. You you might just be ideally placed to implement, start to implement change. Okay. So you go through the, the application process, uh, which involves um, sending off um this year involved sending off a video pitch for your idea why you are an ideal candidate to implement innovation Mm -hmm. and then you kind of go to another pitch and you get grilled (laughs) and then you get accepted onto the program which is it's it's eight days of training Mm -hmm. over the year but the opportunity to be mentored by industry leads and both in the commercial and nhs sector to actually make your idea happen and that to me is so exciting because I kind of felt a bit like you know you kind of feel a lot of the time like all your ideas are in your head and you're sort of trying to do things you know in your spare time and so for me it's so exciting to be on that program because the prospect of actually making things happen and being able to network in that way is um is amazing okay um so i mean hearing about that innovation project sounds cool i guess one thing i would ask for you um so share it with us uh, i guess you know your experiences and, and that kind of stuff so you mentioned already having to do video kind of blogs um to get video things yeah. to get onto it you know um it'd be yeah. cool to see how that goes to, you know so, so that other people can see the experience and maybe you know uh, with, with your knowledge of social media sharing your whole experience as you go through the program itself um i don't know uh, yeah what do you think? yeah 100%. yeah i would do you know i was thinking the same thing so so the irony mm-hmm. is as someone that speaks about social media all my experience in social media has been with working with other individuals and also on my husband's brand okay. uh, and so actually I said exactly the same thing that, that the reason I'm so excited about being on the program is that I, I, I don't think there are many GPs on there mm-hmm. and I think that's crazy especially with the creative minds that I meet mm-hmm. um, like yourself and you know the hundreds of other people that I speak to. Um, and so I, I think maybe, maybe, you know, GPs need to start dominating this program. Oh, um, so I think the first, I think I'm going to be at the NHS Expo in September. So I was planning on video blogging just about that, just the whole experience itself, because also like th- this, this is new to me as well. You know, I'm, I'm as, as a social media sort of consultant and understanding, you know, digital marketing and so on. I'm aware that my, knowledge of tech is very niche for example i'm not a coder Mm -hmm. i've been going to hackathons and things like that but i'm not a coder and so i'm very aware of the different roles and i I would love to be able to share that with people because it's quite a new world to me as well but yeah i would be well up for that definitely so you you told us about you know you love the social media and stuff so uh, why don't you you know tell us where that's taking you where where is that leading you towards uh within healthcare yeah okay so Again, the the way it arose is it's really interesting because a lot of the general feeling from our profession is that, you know, having a social media presence and indulging time in social media is exactly that, an indulgence. Mm. And however, what I realized when I was working in the art sector is that actually if you look at social media as a really powerful medium for communication and very personal communication. So all the kind of stuff we don't have time for when we're in the consulting room, Mm -hmm. I kind of realized that if, if as, as doctors, as GPs, as practices, we learn actually how to leverage that in a safe way, Mm -hmm. we actually have, have power to have the power to almost connect, you know, with our patients again and connect with our communities again in a way that we can't, we can't necessarily because of the constraints of time day to day. I'm not sure if that makes sense. So okay. what I started to, to look at was how um, doctors and practices that successfully use social media with their, with their patients, you know, how are they using it? And I compared that with kind of industry standards. So I looked at, um, I looked at, um, for example, coaching practices or a lot of us based practices mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, do health education and I looked at what they were doing and how they were doing it with success. And so that led me down the road to sort of teaching and consulting on how to, how to use social media really to, I guess it's almost like establishing your brand as a general, as a general practice. Mm -hmm. Um, And the practices you see using it successfully are are, are ones that, for example, from their Facebook page, you know, they get, they are able to sort of broadcast education pieces, yeah. communicate directly with their patients. Mm-hmm. You know, they use Twitter as a notice board to talk about latest things mm-hmm. happening. What happens is that you develop this real 
personable communication that we don't always have time for anymore because we're also stretched mm-hmm. and busy. Um, and so it, it led to kind of this quite niche area, if you like, for kind of forward thinking practices, if you like. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you your practice does use social media as well, doesn't it, to communicate with with patients? Is that Right. Yeah. So I've been running a um, practice Facebook yeah. page uh, for the past, uh, I think we're coming up to about six months or so. Yeah. Um, purely and simply because I wanted a um, a method to communicate with our, particularly our younger patients, actually, yeah. because our PPG is great. They're really supportive. Yeah. But our PPG, like many yeah. PPGs, is a particular subset of patients uh, yeah. that are interested in the way that the practice runs about health um but you know unfortunately towards the later stages of life kind of thing so I, I wanted a way that we can try and engage with the younger population particularly yeah um and yeah, yeah like you said you know with that I, I put on lots of regular um posts about um health advocacy about active you know accessing services that kind of stuff when we've had challenges so um i think it was a, a few days ago unfortunately we had a couple of clinicians call in sick so you know i just i just posted it on there you know, yeah. Um, thanks for all your hard work, uh, but please, you know, we, we are struggling today. If you need to use us, please, um, you know, use us appropriately and here are other services that you may find more effective because we knew it was going to be chaos and we knew yeah. it was going to be busy because we were suddenly two clinicians down that we just couldn't fill, you know, for love and the money. And, you know, sometimes getting that last minute cover is just not an impossible. Yeah. And, you know, we, we had some of our patients respond to that. So for me, that, that, that's a, a useful thing. Um and I, I do think it is an effective way of communicating with patients. Yeah, and, and I think I think one of the key things is that what I always talk about is that you know it's not it's not about having a different kind of presence online. Mm-hmm. It's bringing online what you do offline. So it's just leveraging mm-hmm. your presence and your time as well. Um, so that's one aspect is getting sort of practices to proactively use it. Um, Obviously, through kind of the work that I've done, I'm often asked about kind of all the legalities and things around it as well. You yeah. know, what's safe to use, what isn't to mm-hmm. use, what isn't safe to use as well. And I guess particularly post May 25th, GDPR has probably played a huge impact in that, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So the, the, obviously, it was it was all a bit scary. I think for everyone in the whole world ever mm-hmm. <laughs> that has a business that has a digital presence in the EU. But actually, you know, it is common sense if if you absolutely. Mm-hmm down gdpr it was actually completely common sense it was like do i have permission to talk to people yeah through this medium are they expecting my stuff am i being respectful of their privacy and that was i think that was all of it in simple terms wasn't it really mm-hmm. um and i think um also obviously facebook itself had to step up and agree to those terms which yeah. it did and and i think again the other when i'm asked about it i mean i I, I could sort of bore you with loads of dry sort of legal stuff. You know, I'm not a lawyer, but mm-hmm. I've looked into all of it. But again, it's common sense. You know, you're not you're not going to you're not going to do anything on social media that you wouldn't do in any other kind of forum when you were talk if you were talking about patients. You know, um, and I actually wrote a, wrote a, an article for Pulse Online this week. If you really want to kind of look into the detail of it, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so there was a big sort of furor before GDPR. I was getting asked loads of stuff. Uh, and then all of that's kind of died died down again. It, it's really common sense. We do, we do so much training as GPs, don't we, in terms of data handling and so on. So the same applies yeah. to social media. It's just another distribution channel, if you like, for communication. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about social media then and, you know, kind of practice and stuff. What would yeah. you say would be your your top five tips for a practice that's looking to use social media um, to either engage within the practice or with patients, and I know they may be two separate, you know, ways. But you know, what do you think? Okay, so um, I would. I think the most effective. Well, I guess there are two channels. So number one, choose your channel. Mm-hmm. The most effective channels, I think, are a Facebook page mm-hmm. um, and a Twitter account. So a good way to think of a Facebook page is um, like your shop front 
or mm-hmm. your community notice board. So people get very mixed up between groups and pages. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a good way to differentiate. A group is literally a group. So imagine your patient participation group, mm-hmm. but your Facebook page is like your shop window. So that's your notice board. That's where you're going to be telling people about your services, your updates, yeah. things that are happening and so on. So that's number one. Choose your platform. Mm-hmm. Make it easy for yourself. Choose one or two. If you want to choose two, you've got Twitter and Facebook. So I guess that's number one. Fine. Okay. Number two, absolutely don't consult. <laughs> that sounds really obvious, but yeah. you're always going to get the odd person that's going to ask you something really personal or they you know, they might even take a picture of like their Veruca or whatever and say, what's this doctor? Mm-hmm. Just always direct them gently to, you know, your phone line. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, so obviously, yeah, don't consult on, uh, online. Um, it's usual just to have a few rules on there. So in a pin on a pinned post, just say, hi, this is our practice notice board. This is for X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. This isn't for X, Y, and Z. If you want, you can invite people to message you via Facebook. But again, it's usually good to direct any personal queries directly to the practice. Mm-hmm. So just some basic ground rules are great. And then it's, it's kind of a mixture of things. I think remembering what I said for, for number four is thinking about your content. Remember what you're trying to do is just bring whatever your offline communication is online. Mm-hmm. So if you're a practice, for example, that does loads of charity walks, if you're a practice that runs education events, mm-hmm. if you're a practice that, um, I don't know, has a partner that's running a marathon mm-hmm. or something like that, that's kind of your, your mix of content that you want to put a good mix of sort of educational stuff things that people need to put in the calendar, like maybe flu season coming up, are you ready? Um, And also kind of the things that make you more human as a practice. So like you said, oh, guys, today we've got two people off sick. Please be patient with us. You know, thank you for all your support. All of that stuff helps to build that relationship with the patient as well. So when it comes to, you know, perhaps tricky times of the practice of your facing patient complaints or things like that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that mm-hmm. security of knowing that you've spent time relationship building, that you know, that that can really be channeled through your content. Mm-hmm. And then number five, video. I think video is really underused. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I would absolutely um, recommend practices to experiment with video and it can just be live video. It doesn't have to be all singing, all dancing. Yep. It can just be yep. a daily or a weekly post from the partner or the practice manager. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our page. This week we are doing X, Y, and Z, or we are running a flu clinic, or we are short-staffed, whatever it is. Again, the power of video to really connect um, is is amazing, and I think it's really underused. So I think that's five. I think that's my five. <laughs> I could go on forever, but that's my top five. Got it. So um, you mentioned about not consulting um, before on over social media and stuff. Yeah. Now, obviously, there are um, some people that, that do feel that consulting over social media is acceptable um, for whatever reason that may be. I mean, yeah. it, it, and don't forget, social media includes things like, for example, WhatsApp and, and you know all these other kind of um, uh, methods and that kind of stuff. If you, you know, people found themselves yeah. in that situation where, you know, friends, family is a common example, you know, how would you suggest to them that they kind of handle that situation? Because it can be weird. It, yeah, it can be really weird, but I think it's completely fine to just, even just saying to the person, look, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not able to consult mm-hmm. online. Um, I can advise if you have a problem mm-hmm. around this, there are some useful websites like NHS website and so on. But actually for that, I recommend, you know, mm-hmm. see your own GP and just, just be very clear that you, you can't do that online. I think the, the general thing is to educate, mm-hmm. not consult. Um, and there's that subtle difference. So sometimes that can happen. So I, I did have one individual who, you know, who would kind of say, oh, um, I think they, they talk a lot about the childhood diseases like okay. measles and rashes and what to look for. Uh, and sometimes in response, he'll get snapshots of like a rash and he'll just say, look, 
Um, this isn't a consulting service. Mm-hmm. It's to advise. Um, if you're concerned, just see your own GP. And, and everyone's fine with that, really. Sometimes you just need to gently redirect people. Because a lot of the time with the public, they, they're not really, you know, they're not fully aware of all the barriers and all the things mm-hmm. that we have to think about. Um, and, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe if it's two weeks to see their own doctor, they're like, mm-hmm. oh, look at this thing online. So it's just it's just being clear about what what the um what the barriers are i guess okay and how do you see that different to i guess um this new method of consulting which is things like um you know online consultations in in the formal sense so we've obviously got companies like babylon push doctor doctor care anywhere all these kind of services that are developing um and becoming quite more prevalent how how do you see yeah. that different to you know um kind of ad- advice over twitter or or that kind of stuff yeah so for those things, when you're looking at um, commercial-based social media platforms, mm-hmm. they don't adhere to the kind of strict privacy standards that we absolutely sure. need, you know, in, within the medical profession. And so the online consultation apps are a different kettle of fish mm-hmm. and they are designed well, I hope they are anyway, <laughs> but they should be designed with those privacy and security kind of measures in place. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, for example, I mean, one of the main things is that, you know, WhatsApp, and again, I talk about this a little bit in the article that I wrote, that WhatsApp is so wildly, wi- widely mm-hmm. used in the healthcare profession because there isn't really anything else on par with it in terms of how quickly you can kind of communicate and send mm-hmm. things. And it's kind of linear nature of being a messaging app. Um, however, it doesn't, it doesn't adhere to, you know, the privacy standards. And I think their servers are outside of the EEA. Yes, so that poses massive problems. So- Definitely agree there because if our listeners will remember in our episode that me and Andy covered on GDPR, we actually talked about this, the fact that WhatsApp is definitely not GDPR compliant. And yeah. um, actually there are, there are alternatives uh, which a lot of clinicians don't know about. So um, yeah. particularly companies like Silo and uh, Forward yeah. are alternatives. But anyway, carry on. Yeah, no. So, so this is interesting because it, because uh, yeah, this will probably link through to one of, I think, your your favorite questions that you might ask me afterwards. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think, so, so the challenge is um, whatever app is developed needs to adhere to these things so that, you know, information governance is, is respected, really. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so like you said, there are apps out there. They're just not well-known enough mm-hmm. um, or whatever. The uptake isn't what it is, but, you know, I think we should be focusing on that. So to, back to answering your question, I think that's the main thing is that the commercial apps, they, they're not they're not fit for consulting because of, you know, there's not really any ring fencing around sure. the confidentiality. So the risk, yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to see what that does to your, uh, <laughs> your MDU, uh, <laughs> MDU thing if you start to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've got a feeling that would probably increase it by magnitude of 10 at least. <laughs> at least 10, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So we're talking about apps and we, you mentioned the commercial kind of ones. Um, like you said, I, I've got a couple of favorite questions I like to ask. You know, pretty much everyone cool. I come across when I talk about tech and that kind of stuff. So uh, from, from your perspective, um, what is your favorite kind of work or, or clinical app that you, you, know, you kind of find yourself using on a regular basis? Okay, so... Um, So my favorite work-based app is um, Asana, which is a Mm -hmm. project management app. I've actually got a couple, and they're not directly clinically related. Asana is brilliant for Mm -hmm. managing multiple things. So I run a number of uh, different projects at any one time. So it helps me to kind of map out timelines and sort of tick things off. Okay. I just find it absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, let's go with Asana. (laughs) Cool. And, um, yeah, we all need downtime. We all need kind of like um, other kind of things to occupy us and stuff. So so what would be your favorite non-work app? You know, the one that is on your phone or or your tablet, whatever, that you just simply use to just, yeah, this is for me kind of thing. I really love Audible at the moment. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm I'm a a little bit of a, a, um, I'm geeking out a bit on history at the moment. So I'm reading a couple... I'm listening okay. to, should I say, a couple of really great things on Audible. I used to read a lot more, but um, my, uh, my my son's nine months and just wants to chew any book 
uh, insight. Mm. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm listening to to loads of uh, fun stuff on Audible at the moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so just for our listeners that may not be aware of it, Audible is basically a audio book um, version of Netflix is probably the best way to describe yeah, it. You know, yeah. So a service that allows you to listen to books rather than having to read books. Um, so yeah, ideal for those people that kind of people that like listening to podcasts. Yeah. Hi guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's something really nice about um, listening to, to books in the author's own voice as well. Mm. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's my favorite, favorite, uh, cool. favorite one for me. Yeah. So I, I know you've been up to a few other things more recently, haven't you? And, and particularly um, you've created a company called um, a Business for Doctors. Yeah, it's called Doctors for Business. <laughs> oh, Doctors for Business. Uh, okay, sorry, getting it the wrong way around. Not good. Yeah. So, so Doctors in Business just evolved because um, I, was con- I was constantly being asked around the stuff that we've talked about today, really. Um, again, because people mm-hmm. can see sort of what what I was talking about in terms of social media, and so the people, the, the name came up because it's often doctors who are in various roles and you know either run practices or run businesses or run private practices. So you mm-hmm. know, I kind of one day I was just thought, I, you know, I should give this a name because like there's enough happening there for it to be a thing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I launched Doctors in Business, but also because there were people perhaps that, um, you know, wanted to learn a bit more of the nuts and bolts stuff, really. So um, we've been, we run um, free webinars every month. Mm-hmm. Um, so last week we, uh, sorry, last month we run webinars on uh, Facebook, kind of navigating your way around Facebook, how to get the best use out of it. I think mm-hmm. this month we're running that one again. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we're running one on YouTube, uh, and then after that, we're going to have some fun stuff lined up. So, a design, like a DIY design academy, where you can kind of start to think about branding elements and things like okay. that. So, I it it was built actually in response to the number of things that were landing in my inbox, like, oh, can you tell me a bit more about this, a bit more about that? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it felt like like a natural progression. Okay. So if our listeners wanted to get in contact with you, if they wanted to, you know, um, find out more about doctors in business, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, yeah. So just, uh, on my website. So I'm, I'm on Twitter, um, and on LinkedIn as at doc Aisha Malik, D O C and then my name, um, okay. or just the website, www.doctorsinbusiness.org. Um, yeah. So that's where you can find out about the webinars. Cool. And we'll put those links into the show notes for our listeners. So if you want a quick way of getting to them, it'll be there for you. Um, so just before we sign off, um, I, I like to ask this other question. It's a little bit more um, open, so feel free to go wild with this one. Um, so imagine if you had £100 million to spend on health tech, okay, um, and no red tape. That's the key thing. No red tape whatsoever. Can you imagine that? It, it would be awesome, <laughs> wouldn't it? How would Wouldn't you spend it? Just... it? What would you want to do? Yeah, what, what's that thing in there? To... Does it have to be on like any one thing or can it be on a few? It things? can be on, you know, you've got a hundred million. How you want to spend it? The only proviso is, is it has to be on things around health technology and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cool. So related to what we were talking about before, mm-hmm. about the uh, health messaging apps that are out there. Mm-hmm. So I would invest heavily on the rollout of an app, a messaging and social media app Mm -hmm. that adhered to the privacy standards to make it a safe, to provide a safe app for us to use where if we needed to Mm -hmm. discuss things confidentially, Mm -hmm. we could do that without fear. Okay. Yeah. That apps, there is absolutely a need for that. So, so not, not just creating it. Mm -hmm. So obviously if it's already been created, but actually the amount of time and money it takes to roll these things Mm -hmm. out. And then I would, make sure that was rolled out absolutely everywhere so that everyone was using mm-hmm. it um, in general practice or and the wider health sector. Um, and then linked to that, I would, I would create and roll out a referral app. Okay. So one app for every single referral, <laughs> like every across all specialities. Wow. You said go yeah, crazy, definitely. right? <laughs> would be like a one touch oh cardiology referral with the information across because if if you linked that to the messaging mm-hmm. app right you've already got something there that 
that is in place for it to be a safe place to transmit sure. information, okay. right? So I would I would attach this kind of referral mm-hmm. element to it that would and that would totally get around all those wasted hours of ring this number and then this number and then ring the other number and then get the patient to do mm-hmm. this, which is happening a lot at the moment at the practice where I am where I'm wow. at. Um and every single referral would have to go through that app. Like two ways. And it would be two way. The consultant could then ask you about your referrals mm-hmm. through that app. Can you imagine that? How much fun would that be? Yeah, I, I think uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite interesting, actually, because um, so I know of a few companies that already kind of do the um, um, the messaging aspect of things. So I mentioned them earlier. There's companies like Silo, yeah. uh, Forward, and, and there's a few others out there that have GDPR compliant messaging apps for clinicians to use. Yeah, yeah. You're right, though. No, no one's looked at the um, referral side yeah. of things. Uh, and um, uh, I can imagine in America, it, my God, they would love this yeah. you know, um, because yeah, obviously they have a completely right? different structure of healthcare um, and it would be potentially quite lucrative in that respect. Yeah. But, you know, in the UK, I, I don't think anyone's really considered that. So that, that sounds quite interesting, really. My idea for it was was this. So imagine, so if you imagine the journey through a messaging app. So let's just say you're mm-hmm. like um, a ca- cardiology reg, right, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm a GP, so I'm like, oh... There's this, um, you know, there's this patient and this is what the ECG looks like. And so I snapshot that mm-hmm. across to you. So you come back with mm-hmm. a bit of blurb. Oh, check this, this and this. I go and do that. Say, look, heart sounds are doing this. Mm-hmm. And we kind of have this exchange. The natural process after that would be, if needed, would be to be able to press a button that said refer. And I think that was when my idea came. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my God, if you had like this one app where everyone could refer everything to, even those kind of community pop-up referral thing, you know, referral services yeah. that come up for a bit. If they all yeah. had to go through one app, can you imagine how amazing that would be? Yeah, that'd be so much easier. Maybe that's one that, like, we need to take to a hackathon or something Definitely. and make it happen, right? Yeah, <laughs> or maybe one for your entrepreneur program, you know? Get them to... to yeah, maybe I'll change my entire idea, right? <laughs> Why not? Let's go for it. Why not? Yeah, it's like, guys, I changed my mind. <laughs> cool. Well... Thank you for joining us, Aisha. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you today. Um, and I hope everything goes well with the Clinical Entrepreneur Program. And, and, and I will be watching out for those, um, you know, the, the, those blogs, those videos and, and that kind of stuff to, to see how you're progressing on that because it sounds like a really interesting opportunity that um, potentially, you know, sh- shared wider can be quite interesting for a lot of our listeners and stuff. So, yeah, I'm going to hold you to account on that one if that's okay. Yeah, do you know what? Hundred percent, because a bit of a accountability and kind of how busy general practices would be brilliant. You know, I'm mm-hmm. going to have to do it now because I've promised you. But um, <laughs> I think, I think, I think, I think kind of the main thing is I, I kind of feel like, you know, if I, if I can get onto a program like this, imagine mm-hmm. like how many other GPs would be totally amazing on it as well. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm totally up for sharing the journey. Wouldn't it be great if we had like a ton of GPs getting through next year? That'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be awesome. Wouldn't it? <laughs> cool okay well thank you for joining us um and wish you well on the entrepreneur program and i think hopefully we'll get to speak to you soon yeah cool wicked thanks for having me no worries speak to you later bye bye i hope you found that episode useful as we spoke to dr aisha malik owner of doctorinbusiness.org as always all the resources and aspects that we talked about are available in the show notes including the certificate of engagement which you can append for your appraisal in our next episode Andy and Gandhi, myself, talk about the use of telemedicine in primary care and the implications this may have moving forward. It's a really hot topic at the moment and obviously quite an in-depth episode. In fact, I think this is our longest episode yet. Don't let that deter you though. We talk about lots of different aspects and give you our opinions as well, as well as some developments that we've been working on, including two new aspects. One, a bit of a surprise, so make sure you listen out. Two, well, prequel for it, we videoed this episode. So you'll be able to see exactly how the EGP Learning Pod Blast works. Make sure you check it out. We apologise if we look a little bit funny, but hey, it'd be fun to see how we do this, wouldn't it? As always, feel free to subscribe and click the bell where appropriate to make sure you get notified of every episode as they come out. And this is available on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube and Spotify. If you want to, make sure you contact us and we are more than welcome to receive any feedback on the episodes that you've been listening to or how you'd like us to develop the EGP Learning Pod Blast. Feel free to contact us on either of our social media routes, which are available in the show notes as well. See you later, guys. Bye.